Hello and welcome to Choose a Fi. Today on the show, we have an absolute treat. The godfather of financial independence is here. The one, the only, JL Collins. I just get super excited every time JL is on the show. I mean, this is probably his sixth visit to Choose a Fi. And each and every one is just so well received by our community because his knowledge is truly fundamental. This is the bedrock of Fi. It's the bedrock of understanding what the path is to financial independence. He changed my life personally in so many ways, gave me clarity when I didn't feel comfortable with my investing strategy. And I think this is just really, really critical. And he's here as a friend, of course, but more importantly right now is his new book, Pathfinders, just came out. So this is either a sequel or a companion to the simple path to wealth and its pathfinders, extraordinary stories of people like you on the quest for financial independence. And the book is phenomenal. So we're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about the simple path and 32 things to know about following the simple path to wealth. You're going to really like this episode. With that, welcome to Choose Fi. JL, my friend, it is so wonderful to see you. Thank you for being here. It's an honor to be back, Brad. I always enjoy our conversations. Yeah, this should be a fun one. So, okay, let's just start real quick. I said either it's a sequel to or a companion to The Simple Path to Wealth. So how do you conceptualize Pathfinders? Well, you know, I think of it as a sequel, but, you know, I'm going to steal your companion terminology, which had never occurred to me because that's really the better way to think about it, one of the questions I've gotten is to appreciate Pathfinders, do I have to have read The Simple Path to Wealth? And I don't think you do. In fact, in some ways, Pathfinders might even be the better introductory book because for somebody who is new to this whole FI concept and is maybe thinking about it, Pathfinders is a book that's filled with about 100 stories from people all over the world who are at various stages of walking on the path. And so you can see, okay, this can be done, and here's how people are doing it. And then the simple path to wealth, of course, is the nuts and bolts about how to put it together. So maybe hearing the stories that it can be done is at least as good a place to start. Yeah, I think you're right there. It's funny. That's one thing Jonathan and I have always understood here at Chooseify across 600 plus episodes now is, as we say, stories make the world go round. And it's just that it sounds good. All the book knowledge in the world can, of course, help you. And you're going to be better off. And I don't mean book in the sense of simple path to wealth, but just book knowledge generally. But if you don't take action, it's all for naught. And I think what we found compels people and inspires people to take action is seeing somebody else like them who went through that same life situation or something similar, something they can relate to. And wow, if they can do it, if they did it, I can too. I think that's what was so, so cool to see that you, you really crowdsourced the vast majority of this book to a large degree from those hundred people from your community, from our community. Absolutely. And, you know, I, one of the pushbacks, and I'm sure you've heard it over the years against this idea of pursuing financial independence is, oh, that sounds great, but it's not for me. It's only for some select group of people out somewhere else. And if you read Pathfinders, you will never again be able to say that because Pathfinders has stories from people all over the world, all different walks of life, all different stages of their journey. And I guarantee there are stories in Pathfinders that are coming from people starting at a more challenging place than the people who are listening to us right now. So if you read Pathfinders, you'll be able to say, I choose not to do this. But you won't honestly be able to ever again say, I couldn't do this. Right. So it'll be your choice. This is something that can be done by anybody. I totally agree. And yeah, you actually have in the preface to the book, a section on pursuit. And if you don't mind, I, this was something I highlighted, just jumped off the page to me. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a couple of paragraphs here because I thought this was critical. It said, perhaps you're looking for a better work-life balance, or you might be considering the possibility of a life change, a new career, living in a new part of the world, travel, or simply a different path than the one you've been walking. FI unlocks all these options and more. But here, as these stories show, is the coolest thing. So does its pursuit 
from the moment you step on the simple path, you are a bit stronger, a bit freer, and able to be a bit bolder in the choices you make. The further along you go, the more pronounced those advantages become. Sure, you might give up some material things to start buying your freedom, but this is not about donning a hair shirt and being miserable for a decade so that you can sit around in a hair shirt without a job for a few more decades after that. This is about creating a rich, free life. It is about opening up a whole new world of options and becoming a more robust and independent you. I mean, JL, that is one of those chill-inducing sections of a book. It, it's remarkable. And from the moment you step on the simple path, you are a bit stronger, a bit freer, and able to be a bit bolder. Talk me through that because I think that is the fundamental piece that people miss. They think it's like a binary zero or one, like this is nothing until I'm at phi. But I propose, and you certainly do, obviously more eloquently than I do, that it's from day one. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, thank you for reading that passage. It is one that I'm, I'm proud of. But yeah, one of the misconceptions, I think, to people who are new to this is that it's an on-off switch, right? So one day you're not financially independent, and then the switch is flipped and you are. And that can be very daunting. You know, the idea you hear that, wow, if I want to live on $100,000 a year, I'm going to need $2.5 million invested. And well, that can seem like an insurmountable mountain. But as the old saying goes, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. It's kind of like working out. You know, I, I remember uh, a long time ago, now about 25 years ago, I was going to the gym and I set a goal of bench pressing 300 pounds. Well, obviously I didn't go to the gym and load up the rack with 300 <laughs> pounds to bench press it. But over the course of several months, every day I got progressively stronger. And just because for most of that time I couldn't bench press 300 pounds, that didn't mean that good things weren't happening for me. Because every step along the way, I was that much stronger. And it's the same thing with with your finances. The moment you start saving and investing, you're that much stronger. And then progressively, you get stronger and stronger and stronger until you uh, suddenly wake up one day and you can bench press that 300 pounds or you're now financially independent. And the interim step, by the way, is what I call FU money. So as you are building your wealth, and getting financially stronger, you are accumulating FU money, which gives you more options. It allows you to be bolder in your life and make bolder decisions. Yeah. And I think you have a great example of how you actually used FU money, even though you probably didn't think of it like that at the time, when you had saved up $5,000 from your, your first job, which was a, a monumental amount based on the salary you earned and used it and basically walked into your boss's office. And I'd love for you to tell that story. Sure. So this was, it was my first professional job. This is in the 1970s. I was making $10,000 a year. So, you know, you have to take the time and inflation into account to put that perspective. But I had decided early on that I was going to save 50% of my income. I knew that there were people who could live on $5,000 and there was no reason I couldn't. In fact, when I'd been in college, I was living on even less than that. So $5,000 was a pretty big step up in lifestyle. And I had this, the first professional job I, I got took me two years to get because when I graduated from college, you know, it was time of high inflation and, and a bad economy, which came to be known as stagflation. So it was a very difficult time to enter the workforce. So it took me two years to get this job. And I really liked this job. So I didn't want to give it up. But on the other hand, I wanted to go to Europe for a year and backpack around. And in those days, $5,000 would have been plenty to do that. And as you mentioned, I'd accumulated that. I also didn't realize in those days that things were negotiable. And I think in business, things in those days were a lot less negotiable than they are today. So I thought long and hard about this. And I was trying to decide whether to go take this trip or keep the job that was hard to get that I loved. And I came across this airfare. It was a special deal. And if you left on a certain day and you came back four months later, it was particularly inexpensive. And I thought, well, that's kind of a nice compromise. So I went to my boss and I said, can I take a leave of absence for four months to go to Europe on this airfare? And I, he looked at me like I had two heads. And <laughs> he said, well, of course not, or something along those lines. And get out of my sight. <laughs> and he was probably nicer than that. And, and 
So I left and I, I thought, well, okay, now I really have to make this decision. You know, I'm back to, do I quit the job and go for a year or, or not? And I thought about it for a couple of weeks and decided, you know, I really want to go to Europe. So I went back into his office one day and I resigned. And he was a little shocked. He said, well, why on earth are you quitting? I thought you liked it here. And I said, well, I do. I love it here. But, you know, I really want to take this trip to Europe. And to my utter amazement, and it's important to understand, this was not a negotiating ploy on my part. He said, well, wait a second. Don't do anything hasty. Let me go talk to the guy who owns the company and see what we can do. <laughs> and he came, he came back about a week later and said, you know, if you'll promise to be back after that four months you talked about initially, your job will be waiting for you. Wow. Well, that's when a light bulb went off. And I realized that I had power that I would not have had if I was living paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. Yeah. It is remarkable how much power you do accrue and, and get on your side of the ledger when you start saving money. Right. And I think that becomes very clear to people. I think not only the power, Jail, but the lessened overall stress burden that's on, on oh, you, absolutely. right? Like think about people, so many people live paycheck to paycheck and just any little thing is an emergency and is, is a critical issue in their lives. But the first time you have a couple thousand bucks saved up, regardless of whether you take it and go to Europe or you just save it as an emergency fund, your life is dramatically better. You know, our, our mutual friend, Christy Shen, who, as you know, is the author of uh, Quit Like a Millionaire, has a great way of framing that. And I, and I won't get this exactly right, but I'll get the, the gist of it. Christy says, you know, if, if you know money, if you master money, life is incredibly easy. If you don't, life is incredibly hard. And that speaks to the point you were making. If you have not mastered money, you're going to be living paycheck to paycheck. Or God forbid you're borrowing money to maintain some sort of lifestyle you've been convinced that you need to have. I can't imagine anything worse. It's it's akin to slavery. And how awful it must be to worry, do I have enough money to make it to the end of the month when I get my next check? That seems to be no way to live. But as you alluded to, that's the way an awful lot of people live. And I think because we live in a culture that is always telling you, you deserve a break today, you need to own this or that in order to have a fulfilled life. And none of those options are you need to own your freedom. And my mission with Pathfinders and with the Simple Path to Wealth is I want people to know that one of the things they can buy with their money is their freedom, their financial independence. Now, you may choose not to follow this path, but at least you will know it's an option. I've just met so many people, and I know you have too, Brad, that you know, get to be 40, 50 years old and they come across this stuff and they're, I had no idea. I had no idea that this is something I could have done and better to find out. And then if you, you know, if you say to me that I understand, but I'd rather spend my money on a fancy car or a bigger house or whatever. Well, it's your money, it's your life. You can do whatever you want. I don't want to hear complaints in 20 or 30 years that, you know, <laughs> why your neighbor is retired and traveling the world and you're still working paycheck to paycheck. But, you know, as long as you're willing to lay in the bed you make, then it's your choice. Right. And it is all about choices. And like you said, to you, freedom is the most important thing. And, and you had a passage in the book that I wrote down that I just thought was the best way I've heard ever to describe this. And you were talking to a woman named Kathy at one of your Chautauqua events a, a number of years ago. And Kathy, I think, was was not yet on board with the five concept. She maybe saving to her seemed a little bit like deprivation. And that was, that was kind of the frame in how you described this. And you said, I'm going to tell you a little secret. The truth is I've personally spent every dime I've ever gotten. And for the most part, I've spent them as soon as I got them. And she was incredulous. Really? Is that possible? And you said, absolutely. And I've spent at least half of them on the single thing I value most the thing that gives me the most joy and satisfaction of anything I own, I spent them buying my freedom. And goodness, JL, that was the best way to describe that saving money is the antithesis of deprivation. It is the exact polar opposite. So many people, I think, erroneously think that it is deprivation because that's all they've been led to believe. You know, the FOMO culture, the you have to look rich to impress your friends. 
But all that ultimately matters, I think both you and I would contend, is your freedom. And when you reframe, okay, I'm not saving just for some bizarre, nebulous saving sake. I'm saving for my freedom here and now. I think that changes everything. And I'd love if there's a little more flavor to that story or what was Kathy's response to that? Well, I think it was eye-opening for her. And it was something that I had never thought about in those terms until I was having that conversation with her. So it was a little bit of an epiphany for myself as it as it came to me. But absolutely, because she was talking about how she grew up in a fairly wealthy family and what they did was spend money. And she felt like not spending money was deprivation. And it occurred to me, well, you are spending money. You are just buying something that most people never realize is available to buy, which is their their freedom, their financial independence. And I think once she realized that, oh, it's not just deprivation, I'm buying something. And that really sounds appealing, This because for her, being free was appealing. You know, well, now it was a whole different way to think about it. And like anything else, almost no matter how, how much money you have, whenever you buy anything, it means that you're not buying something else, right? So, you know, if you buy this car, you're not buying that car. If you're buying this house, you're not buying, or maybe you're buying a bigger house and that means you can't buy the fancier car. You're always making those choices. And this is just one more of those choices. And the other thing I, in the story I was telling about, my job and traveling to Europe, I started out living on half of my income. So I was investing half of it. I was spending half of it to buy my freedom. But the other side of that coin is as my income grew. So when I started out making $10,000 a year, I was spending five on freedom and living on the other five. Well, when I was making 20,000, it was 10 and 10. When I was making a hundred thousand, it was 50 and 50. So my material lifestyle also grew and inflated. It just did so in a very controlled fashion, and it allowed me to buy those material things from a position of power, which was important to me. So I have no objection to owning and buying material things. I just want to own and buy them from a position of power. And again, the most important thing for me is buying my freedom. I'm curious where the 50% came from. So this far predated, I know you have the graph in the book from... uh, your friend Darrow, and that'll be a very similar chart to people who have read Pete, Mr. Money Mustache's shockingly simple math article. And right. It basically shows at X savings percentage, so 50%, 45, in increments of 5%, this is how many years until retirement. Right. But I mean, Jail, this, this was probably many years or decades predating any of those blogs, decades certainly uh, predating their existence. Where did 50% come from? Where did you think of that? It was not only predating blogs, it was predating the internet. It was, <laughs> it was predating the common yep. use of, of personal computers. Wow. Yeah, I was wandering in the wilderness and 50%, I, I just literally plucked it out of the air. I knew I wanted to have a significant amount of money going to those investments because I wanted to have that power, that freedom as quickly as possible. But I also wanted to live a life, right? So, you know, 50% just seemed like the magic number. It was literally plucked out of the air. What's interesting to me is, as I've written about this in the last decade, I get two reactions. So particularly from people who are new to the FI concept and community, you know, I will very commonly hear 50% is just, it seems undoable. It can't, it's not possible. I, I was doing an interview a few days ago and, and this guy said, you know, you realize that makes you sound insane. And I, I said, well, I, you know, there are a lot of reasons to think I'm insane, but that's not mm-hmm. one. So there are a lot of people when they first hear that 50%, it just, their mind shuts down. But on the same token, I hear from just as many people who say to me, 50%, you piker. You know, you should be doing 60 or 70 or 80 or 90. I mean, there are people out there who are doing 90%. So again, it's like I was saying about Pathfinders. You can't read Pathfinders and honestly ever say again, it can't be done. So can 50% be done? Absolutely. You might choose to do something less. And as you mentioned, there's a chart in the book that will tell you how many years that will cost you. You might equally choose to do something much more aggressive than I did. And that, of course, will shorten the time. And again, that's a personal choice. 
Agreed. And I think the most critical part is that, again, people make choices, but to do it with eyes wide open, right? To see a graph like this and say, okay, if I only save 10%, which still amazingly puts you ahead of so many people, it's going to be 38 plus years of working, right? So let's just say you happen to start working at 22, you're talking 60. So that's if you save 10%. But obviously, like you said, you can just go down the line. So you save 50%. That's wonderful. It's, it's only going to take you about 14 years of work right. to reach FI. But okay, maybe that for someone who's made choices and lives in a, an expensive house and has car loans and such, maybe that seems insurmountable right now. Well, JL is not saying don't get started, obviously. It's just, okay, look, even saving 30%. Is going to be 22 and change years until you reach five, which is still pretty fantastic. It's the argument of, are you better off pursuing phi? And I think the answer to any question that starts with, are you better off pursuing phi or not, is clearly yes. Are you going to reach it as fast as someone who got this exactly right at 18 years old? No, but that doesn't mean it's not worth the journey. And JL, that's what you're saying with all these stories. And that's what's so great about reading a hundred stories from people who are starting from different places, are in all different parts of the world, have experienced everything you can experience. And they didn't throw their hands up and say it's impossible. They took action. Well, and the other thing is it is the journey, even more than the destination. So you can vastly improve your life and never actually hit that magic financial independence. One of the questions I, I get on a pretty regular basis is from or about older people. You know, what about somebody who's 60 or 70? You know, and you look at that chart and you say, well, you know, it's going to take 10, 12, 14, 15 years. You know, it's 70. Does that make sense? And well, no, probably if you're starting from scratch at 70, you are probably not going to become financially independent until you're very old, assuming you live that long. But as we said earlier, you will make yourself progressively stronger. And that, you know, even if I'd never in the gym gotten to bench press 300 pounds, I would have been better off if I only got to 250 or 225 or whatever. You know, I'm better off by having started the journey. Yeah, without a doubt. And a couple of minutes ago, you talked about, so mastered money. You said that in reference to a, a quote that Christy had said. And I suspect some people might hear that when she says it and thinks, oh, that sounds daunting. That sounds difficult because what is mastering money, right? Like we've all been led to believe that money is difficult, that there's so much complexity to it. And I think the core of your thesis with the simple path to wealth is mastering money is not difficult at all. In fact, it's maybe the one avenue of life that actually knowing less or thinking less, let's say, will actually put you in better stead, which is just, it's so counterintuitive, but I have yet, I mean, JL, I, I, I'd love for your thoughts on this, but I've met a lot of wealthy people. I've met a lot of successful people. I'm yet to find that like secret behind the curtain that had only wealthy people get to, had to experience, or once you get to a $3 million net worth that they let you in on the secret, like there are no secrets. This is actually as simple as you portray it to be. And I, I'd love for, for you to talk about the thesis of The Simple Path to Wealth. Yeah. So I, the, you covered a lot of ground there and, and important <laughs> stuff. So first of all, I, I agree with you. There, there are no secrets. Now, you wouldn't know that listening to the financial media and you wouldn't know that listening to Wall Street because there are an enormous, a plethora of incredibly complex investments. I mean, Wall Street famously created in 07, 08, they created things that led to that debacle that they themselves didn't understand. So from that point of view, is investing and money complex and complicated and difficult? Absolutely it is. <laughs> the vast majority of it is. It is that way by design because something complex and difficult that you can't quite understand I can charge you a pretty hefty fee to say, I'll take care of it for you. So that's the bad news. It's akin to a banquet table that's groaning with all kinds of exotic foods that are incredibly difficult and complex to prepare, right? And on one corner of that huge table are the very simple fruits and vegetables and meats and things that we actually need to be healthy. 
So you could take your arm and put it on that table and sweep all that complex stuff onto the floor because you don't need it. And it's the same thing when it comes to finances and investing. There's all this complex stuff on the table that you are better off sweeping to the floor. And what's left, that healthy stuff that really makes you financially strong, are broad-based, low-cost index funds. And those, which are what I recommend, are the soul of simplicity. Yeah, they are indeed. And I think this is what I referred to in the introduction, which was when I graduated from college, I quickly earned my CPA license and I had a background in, in finance theoretically, but I was so uncertain. I just, I thought that it was complex. I believed the lies, basically. I believe what I what was sold to me. And why and would true. you not? Because that's yeah. what you hear all the time, right? Right. For anybody listening to that who were, who was stunned to hear that it's not complex, I mean, I'm very sympathetic to why you would think it is because you turn on the TV, that's what you're going to hear. Right. And you see, at least in my case, I saw many of the smartest kids at my university going into the finance department and making these big salaries. And like you think, and like you said, you can understand they're sympathetic to the point of view of like, how could these firms, why are they looking for the best and brightest and paying these insane salaries if it doesn't require specialized knowledge, if there isn't some, some secret that people have to learn over years and decades? And that is what we're led to believe. But what you're saying is, is subsequently what I now know to be true about the world is they are just salesmen, basically wrapped up in fancy uh, cryptic knowledge. But at the end of the day, they're trying to sell you something some level of complexity and knowledge that frankly you don't need and is to a large degree, especially net of those fees and all the taxes that come from trading, that it's actually counterproductive. You're going to get a worse return. Certainly, I think over a 30 to 50 year investing lifetime following these fancy strategies because of those fees that you're paying. Right. Well, the research is clear. You're absolutely right on that, that, you know, in any given year, only about 25% of active money managers outpace the index. And then if you go out five years, that percentage drops. And by the time you get out to 30 years, it's less than 1%. <laughs> and that's statistically zero. So the thing that, that our listeners might want to understand is that both things are true, right? So all you really need are these broad-based, low-cost index funds that are the soul of simplicity. That doesn't mean that there aren't this huge range of incredibly complex investment instruments that are aggressively sold because they're very profitable. This is why hedge fund people are billionaires, right? These are incredibly profitable things. And you do need very smart, very technically educated people to try to wrestle with this and deal with it. All of that is true. What's not true is if it does the investor any good. You know, there's the famous story of the guy who's walking through the uh, the boatyard with his broker and the broker's saying, <laughs> oh yeah, this yacht belongs to so-and-so in my firm and this yacht belongs to so-and-so in my firm and this yacht belongs to so-and-so and this yacht here is mine. And the customer finally says, where are the customer's yachts, <laughs> right? Well, yeah. you know, being in the financial business is extraordinarily profitable for the people in that business. For the investors, not so much because they're the ones that are paying the, all those extraordinary fees and commissions. And the more fees and commissions you pay, the bigger a draw on your, on your returns it's going to be because that comes out of your pocket, right? That's one of the things that makes simple, low-cost index funds so powerful and why they outperform. So many examples of this. Warren Buffett famously a bet a hedge fund guy that the S&P 500 index fund would outperform anything this hedge fund person did, or I think it was a collection of hedge funds actually, over the period of a decade. Well, that decade has come and gone. There were years where the hedge funds outperformed, but over the decade, they dramatically underperformed. I mean, I frequently wonder why people buy these things. I mean, I understand why people run them, you know, because you're charging 2% a year that you get regardless of what happens. And then if you happen to make money, then you get 20% of whatever profit it is. And by the way, making money isn't outperforming the index. It's just making more than zero. 
So if the index is up 15% and you're up 10%, you still get 20% of that for your investor. I absolutely understand how that works for the people running hedge funds and the people working there and why they can afford to pay the huge salaries they do. I don't understand why people would buy the things. Yeah. Uh, actually, I had a guest post on my blog recently from Ben Carlson, who is a, he writes a wealth of common sense, which is a great, great blog, yeah. very insightful guy. And, and he's my, a co-host of one of my favorite podcasts too, Animal Spirits. Yes, exactly. And he, uh, at my request, he wrote about this because he has some very technical background in the area. So if anybody's interested more on the, on that subject, you can use the search function on the blog and, <laughs> and find it. Yeah, that's cool. We'll link to that in the show notes. And and yeah, I actually want to talk about the power of index investing because you said that in passing there. And you have a section in Pathfinders on page 131 of the book that I'm looking at in the, the investing section where you go through 10 individual items on the power of index investing. I think this is really the, the crux of the investing aspect of the simple path to wealth. So it's important that we, that we go through that for the audience. But since you brought Warren Buffett up, I wanted to uh, read my favorite quote of his that I think ties so beautifully to what we're talking about today and what your advice, when, when two of my most respected people, JL Collins and Warren Buffett, both are saying the same thing, it's, I, I, I'm fairly certain that there's some <laughs> significant truth there. So the 2013 letter to shareholders, and he talks about low-cost index fund investing, and he said, my money, I should add, is where my mouth is. What I advise here is essentially identical to certain instructions I've laid out in my will. My advice to the trustee could not be more simple. Put 10% of the cash in short-term government bonds and 90% in a very low-cost S&P 500 index fund. I suggest Vanguard's. I believe the trust long-term results from this policy will be superior to those attained by most investors, whether pension funds, individuals, or institutions who employ high-fee managers. And I mean, JL, that has got to be music to your ears when you hear Mr. Buffett say, I mean, obviously you would pick total stock market, but I, I don't think we'll quibble over at the uh, S&P 500, right? Yeah. Well, the S&P 500 index fund is what Jack Bogle himself held until his death. So another financial hero of mine. But yeah, and the important thing about this is Buffett is not talking about small amounts of money. He's talking about billions of dollars. So one of the backhanded compliments that I've gotten in my writing is, oh, J.L. Collins, right? yeah, I mean, it's great. The simple path of wealth is great for people who don't want to work hard enough to understand investing. <laughs> well, that's utter nonsense. It's, it's great for everybody. And certainly Warren Buffett has worked hard enough to understand investing. And he is still recommending precisely the same thing that that I recommend, which are the low cost index funds. And it doesn't matter whether you're investing a few hundred dollars or a few billion dollars. The process is the same. I, I gave an interview a number of years ago where the interviewer wound up with a question that she liked to ask everybody, which is, okay, you have just been given a hundred million dollars. What do you do with it? This was at the end of our interview. And I said, well, I put it in VTSAX. And she was a little surprised. Huh. And I don't know if she thought I would spend it, which is, I guess is how most of her guests respond, or if I would say, oh, well, if I had that much money, here's the more exotic kinds <laughs> of things I would buy. But no, whether I have the relatively modest amount of money I have, or if I had a hundred million, or if I had a hundred billion, it would be in in low cost broad based index funds. And yeah, like Warren, I, I prefer uh, Vanguard's. Yeah, indeed. And right, you're not going to go, uh, oh, I have $100 million. I'm going to buy real estate in London or New York City or, or Singapore or something, right? Like, no. I mean, again, there's no secret. This is how you invest. You invest your money. This is how I invest my money. To people listening, this is truly, this is not some BS of just do what I say, not what I do. This is literally what we do because- as JL said before, and I'm going to paraphrase it in, in the way that my brain kind of conceptualizes this, it's the highest likelihood of success over the long term. It's not that this is the easy path or the brain dead path. It happens to be, but this is the highest likely. If you're just looking at it from a, a gambler's perspective or a poker player's perspective, like you said, 25% of active managers might outperform in a given year. But over a 30 plus year period, that gets down to vanishingly few, well under 1%. And 
what would you pick if you had a 100% chance of matching the market over 30 years and therefore getting market returns at the lowest expense ratio possible, or you had a one in 100 chance of outperforming by just needle in a haystack or through your sheer brilliance, finding somebody who can invest for you or you do it yourself, but you have a one in 100 chance, which option would any rational person pick? The only answer is matching the market. It is the only answer that makes sense from an intellectual perspective when you look at it like that. Plain and simple, end of story, just from a betting perspective. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think the other thing that's important for people to understand is they hear, well, you know, the, if I invest in an index fund, it just gives me the average market return. And average is a word <laughs> that kind of, you know, makes people a little crazy. They say, I don't want average. I want better than average and blah, blah, blah. But the truth is that if you get the market return, your returns are significantly above average. You know, if you go out 30 years, as we already described, you're in the top 1% of returns, right? And even in the first year, you're in the top 75%. So the odds are enormously in your, in your favor by going with an index funds. And average returns in this context doesn't mean the same thing as average in normal conversations. It is considerably better than you can get doing virtually anything else short of being extraordinarily lucky. And then, you know, you may as well be buying right. lottery tickets. <laughs> and you had a Princess Bride reference in Pathfinders. And I think there's another one that logically comes up and I'll probably butcher it, but it's, I don't think that word means what you think it means, right? Like average in this sense is not, you're not right in the middle. You're not at, at 50%. You're not like 50% of people are not doing better than you. Like yeah. you said, on just that very first year, 75%, you're in the 75th percentile. Yeah. And then it go your your percentage of, of where you are in terms of investment returns goes up right. from there. Inconceivable. <laughs> the Inconceivable indeed. So let's talk. I, I queued this up uh, a handful of minutes ago. Let's talk about the power of index fund investing. I know we've probably talked about some of these already, but you talk about buying single stocks and companies having life cycles, whereas when you own an index fund, you own a little bit of all the companies that make up that index. Those are the first three. If you, I'd love if you could go into those. Sure. So I'll just, I, I do have it in front of me, but rather than skim through it and my memory's not that good. But yeah, when you buy VTSAX, which is Vanguard's total stock market index fund, and I do slightly prefer the total stock market index fund over the S&P 500 because it has a little broader reach, you own a piece of virtually every publicly traded company in the United States. And that means that everybody from the factory floor to the CEO is working to make you richer. And the other thing is, and I'm very proud of this term that I coined, the index is self-cleansing. So when I buy VTSAX, I don't ever have to worry about when I have to sell it. When you buy an individual stock, let's say you buy Tesla, well, you immediately have to be getting thinking, how long do I hang on to Tesla? How long is Tesla going to perform well? Well, when I own VTSAX, because it's self-cleansing, I can and intend to own it forever. What does self-cleansing mean? Well, it means that those roughly 4,000 stocks that I own in VTSAX, the publicly traded companies of the United States, some of them are not going to do so well. And they'll drift down to where they finally fall off the index and they will be losers. I don't have to worry about that because they will automatically go away. At the same time, new exciting companies that have, and this is our capitalist system, right? So companies fade away, but new exciting companies are created. They will get added to the index as they go public. And they, you know, any stock that goes down can only drop 100%. Sounds pretty awful until you realize the stocks on the way up can go up 100% right. or 200 or 500 or 10,000%. So it's a rigged system in a sense in our favor because our winners can grow to extraordinary percentages, whereas our losers have a limit to the downside they have. And that self-cleansing process is one of the things that makes the index fund so powerful. The other thing I'll say while I'm on this particular subject is one of the criticisms of an S&P 500 index fund or the total stock market index fund is that they are cap weighted, which means that the bigger, more successful companies represent a bigger part of the portfolio. 
So people recently have said, well, if you own VTSAX or the S&P 500, what you really own is a technology fund because the top companies these days tend to be technology companies. And that's true. But this is not a bug. This is a feature because just like I don't have to worry about what companies are going to go away and what companies are going to be the, the new exciting dominant players, I don't have to worry about what sectors will be. So right now, technology is the exciting dominant sector. It's not always been technology. You know, one of the few advantages of being an old guy is that I have a memory of, you know, it used to be energy companies. It used to be consumer staples. It used to be finance companies. And all the time I owned the index, when those were the top dogs, I owned those. When those faded away, I owned whatever replaced them. I have no idea how long technology will continue to be the dominant player. I have no idea what will replace it when it, that time comes. I don't have to worry about it because whatever it is and whenever it is, I will benefit from it. Yeah, I love that. And it does, it does cycle. And like you said, you've probably seen this over a 50-year adult lifetime at this point, right? And, and you've seen these cycles come and go. Yeah. And you've seen the power of index fund investing. I know it wasn't always that way for you, because obviously when you first started investing, index funds had just, I think, literally what Mr. Bogle at its very, very inception. But it took you a couple of decades to figure it out. But once you did. Yeah, I wish it was only two decades. <laughs> it, actually, I bought my first stock in 1975, which coincidentally was the year that Jack Bogle launched Vanguard. And in December of that year, brought out the first index fund which was an S&P 500 index fund. I didn't know that at the time. I mean, I frequently think, would that I had known that at the time and would that I had been wise enough to embrace it because my path would have been a lot easier and a lot more lucrative if I had, but I didn't hear about index funds until a decade later, by around 1985. And even then I was too slow to really appreciate the enormous advantage they offered. It took me another probably 15 years. I'm a, I'm a slow learner. What can I say? <laughs> but yeah. So I, I can't much regret the first decade because I didn't know about them. But from that point on, I did know about them. And I, I kicked myself for being too slow on the uptake. <laughs> but, you know, to a certain extent, it's very counterintuitive. You know, you I was a stock picker in those days and I was doing okay doing that. In fact, my dirty little secret is I became financially independent as a stock picker. So you look at it and you say, well, gee, I mean, I, it's got to be easy to outperform the index. All I have to do is avoid the bad companies, you know, or all I have to do is focus on the good companies. And that just sounds so reasonable, at least it did to me. But the truth is that that's extraordinarily difficult to do. So anyway, it, uh, I was a slow learner. But it's funny when I hear people argue against indexing now. I hear my own voice in my head because they, they're all the same arguments I used to make back in the day. Yeah, I hear you. And uh, I, I think another thing with picking individual stocks, so clearly it doesn't negate your your entire message here with the fact that you reach by basically individual stock picking. Because I think at its essence, and you say this very early in the book, you say about a little secret, right? It really is this simple. And you have three bullet points, spend less than you earned. And my little paraphrase is, you save 50% of your income. That pretty much cures all ills. You say, avoid Makes debt. A lot of mistakes. <laughs> right? Like you can make a whole lot of mistakes. I'm sure all things equal, you would have rather found Mr. Bogle's index fund in 1975. And been wise enough to embrace it. <laughs> well, of course. Of course. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so, right. It's spend less than you earn, avoid debt, and invest the difference. And it really is that simple. Like your, your financial life. I would argue, obviously, you could always add a little more, like you automate it to take your brain out of it, but, you know, little, little things at the margin, but obviously you agree with those things too. It's just, these are the three major bullet points and it really can be that simple. You don't have to overthink it. Like you say in this section, the power of index investing, when you index invest, you don't have to think about the timing of buying at the right time and selling at the right time. I mean, JL, this is a one-way street for you, right? Absolutely. And I think you touched on a pretty important point a moment ago, too, that by talking about how I achieved financial independence picking stocks, because it's important to realize that stock picking and by extension, picking actively managed funds run by stock pickers, it's not like that can't work. 
right? So you're not, when you're looking at that versus index funds, it's not like you're looking at something that's bad and something that's good. You're looking at two good things. One is just a lot easier and it's more powerful and it's simpler. Doesn't mean the other can't work. It will just take a whole lot more effort and time and risk to make it work. So I think that confuses people too, because I'm sure there are stock pickers out there saying, well, wait a second, I'm doing okay picking stocks. And I'm probably not going to argue with that. I, I did okay picking stocks. Now, of course, there's some people who try to pick stocks and get killed doing it because right. it's, it's a tricky thing to do. But yeah, I would have been, it's not like my life would have, financial life would have been terrible if I hadn't embraced indexing. It's just that the moment I embraced indexing, it became a lot more powerful and a lot easier. And that's the reason I really wish I'd embraced it sooner. People ask me, what's the worst financial decision you ever made? And it wasn't some of the stinky stocks I bought, and I did buy some pretty stinky stocks. <laughs> it was the fact that it took me so long to embrace indexing. That's what really cost me the most in not only returns and money, but in time and effort. Agreed. And I think what's also important, like we're trying to really make a case here for, again, this, this long-term thinking. I think all of success personally in life comes from thinking long-term, not just, hey, can I outperform over this short period of time? Like you're saying, yeah, somebody comes up to you and says, I'm doing a pretty good job here picking stocks. And I think my argument would be, okay, that's a really small sample size, right? That might be six months, a year, even three years, five years. Like, I think there's reversion to the mean and maybe below the mean ultimately, like we're saying with, with really the smartest people. You think about who are the people running these big actively managed mutual funds at major companies. These are the people who have succeeded in every level of academia, right? These are the Harvard and, and Penn graduates and they are now running. They're, they're the masters of the universe. But they yet, we've said, only 1% of them, basically, over a 30-year period, are going to outperform you and I just buying VTSAX. By the way, it's amazing how many of those people have their personal money in index funds, right? right? And so those people, you know, you call them masters of the universe, and they become very, very wealthy. But it's important to understand they're not becoming wealthy because of their investment acumen as Warren Buffett has, is they're becoming wealthy because of the fees they charge managing other people's money. That's an entirely different kind of thing. Yeah, agreed. Totally agreed. And one other thing I really wanted to clarify, because just being in your presence makes me basically say the word, say VTSAX. And, <laughs> and I think th this is really important because a lot of people in our community, of course, know, love, and respect you. And just say VTSA. It's become almost like I say this in the best way possible. It's almost become like a meme, like in that, <laughs> like, right. It just perpetuates itself. But I want to be really clear to our audience. And I know you have this in the book repeatedly. So you are not just, it's only VTSAX or nothing else. There are a lot of very similar broad-based low-cost index funds that are either total stock market or S&P 500 at Schwab, Fidelity, Vanguard, other places, et cetera. And I definitely, I don't know if you have any flavor to add to that. Of course, you like Vanguard. Mr. Buffett likes Vanguard. Obviously, Mr. Bogle founded Vanguard, but there are other options. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with everything you said. And a total stock market index fund, whether it's VTSAX, which is Vanguard's, or I don't know what Fidelity's ticker is, or T. Rowe Prices, or Schwab's, but basically, if it's tracking a total stock market index fund, it's essentially the same thing. Same thing with an S&P 500 fund. It's essentially the same thing. Now, there are reasons that I prefer Vanguard, and I have a post about that. And if you want, we can talk about that. But that's not the most important thing. If you're with Fidelity, as an example, and you like Fidelity, and a lot of people who use Fidelity appear to like it, evidently, their service is good, their website's easy to use and, and what have you, and you're with their index fund, then you are absolutely fine with that. I, no problem at all. Yep. Totally agree. And I think any time that we can cut down that paralysis factor, right, or the friction that might get people caught up from taking action, right? I, so many people, I've had dozens of emails over the years, probably more than that saying, oh, I want to invest in low cost funds but I don't have the $3,000 to open VTSAX. So what do I do? 
And I think you talk in the book repeatedly about there is an exact analog of a ETF, exchange traded fund, just at Vanguard, VTI, right? This right. is, it is more or less the exact same thing. And I think last time I checked, it was somewhere around $200 a share. And you probably can even buy fractional shares for all I know. But so that lowers the barrier to entry. I know there are probably some reasons that, that you personally like the mutual fund better, but nevertheless, like don't let that stop you. VTI is 99.9% the same as VTSAX for all intents and purposes. If that is the friction that's going to make you say, oh, I can't do this. It's going to take me forever to invest $3,000. Okay, you don't have to. Well, the bar has been lowered now to about $200. Yeah, so there are, I agree with everything you said. There are differences between a mutual fund and an exchange-traded fund, an ETF. But none of those differences really matter to people like us who are long-term investors. I probably, the reason I prefer the mutual fund is because that's what was available when I was coming up and that's what I'm used to. But anybody who's owning VTI, the ETF, or for that matter, the equivalent ETF at Fidelity or Schwab, that's fine. And it is for all intents and purposes, exactly the same portfolio. It is a total stock market or an S&P 500 index portfolio. So couldn't agree more. And, you know, there is no reason not to own the ETF version. There are differences between the two, but again, nothing that need concern us. Totally, totally agree. And I floated at the top of the episode here. You have this amazing blog post called 32 Things to Know About Following the Simple Path to Wealth. And we're going we're gonna to link this up in the show notes because I, I really want everyone to look at this. I think this is just such a beautifully succinct way to describe this entire framework of an investing life and really just the whole simple path to wealth, every aspect of it. And JL, we've touched on so many of these, but really the first one is just the best encapsulation and it's investing done well is the soul of simplicity. And that that is beautiful. I can't come up with a better way to describe it. It is the soul of simplicity and you don't have to look further than that. There's no secret behind the curtain. There really isn't. Well, and then, of course, the second point and to follow that up is anyone who tells you differently is selling <laughs> you something. Oh, yeah. And we've certainly touched on, on that quite a bit. Yeah. So, Brad, I appreciate you bringing up that very recent blog post. And it puts me in mind of another one that makes a different, but I think equally important point. And it's one of my personal favorites on my blog. And I, I wrote it in, I want to say, 2015. The title is, and please link to it in the show notes, the title is uh, Time Machine and the Future Value of Stocks. And the idea in that post is I go back to 1975, which is we talked about as the year I started investing. And I say, suppose I'm sitting around the campfire with a few of my friends and we've been smart enough or fortunate enough to learn that Jack Bogle has just created this newfangled index fund and we're sitting there speculating, gee, I wonder how that's going to work out over the next four decades <laughs> you know, out to 2015. And I say, well, as a matter of fact, I am just back from 2015 in my time machine, and I can tell you exactly how those 40 years have gone. And then the rest of the post is laying out all the terrible things that happened in that 40-year period. And they were legion. I mean, you know, from the Business Week headline being the death of equities to Black Monday in 87, the biggest one day drop in history, even bigger than anything in the depression to the, you know, the 9-11 and the tech market crash after that to the debacle in 07, 08 to, you know, war, you know, the Iraq and Afghanistan wars and, you know, all these terrible things, this hyperinflation in the 70s and early 80s. Anyway, the post goes through all of those things. And of course, everybody's sitting around campfires. Holy cow, am I glad that you told us there's no way we're going to be investing in stocks over the next 40 years. That has to be a disaster. And of course, the truth is over that 40-year period, stocks returned, the S&P 500 returned almost 12% a year, which is stunning. There is nobody who uses a formula of 12% a year. The chart that you referenced earlier about how many years it takes to reach financial independence of what savings rate, I think uses 8% a year, which is considered pretty aggressive. But the truth is that 40-year period with all these disasters returned 12% a year. The point isn't that we can expect 12% going forward. 
The point is the market does not need a perfect world in which to go up. There is a cliche on Wall Street that says the market climbs a wall of worry. And there is always something to worry about in the world. There's always something bad going on. That's certainly true as we're recording today. Uh, There's some tragic things going on in the world. Uh, It was true during COVID when people were telling me, oh, now this is the end. The simple path isn't going to work anymore. Tragic as all those things are, the market still relentlessly goes up. Make no mistake, it's a wild and volatile ride, and it certainly was over those that period of time, but it still returned on average 12% a year, which is stunning when you think about it. So there is no perfect time to invest in the market. There's always going to be reasons not to, and the corollary is it's always a perfect time. Yeah. That is beautifully, beautifully put. And yeah, you say in your book uh, about staying the course in a downturn, quote, this time it isn't different, right? And I think that's the most important thing to remember. Like, yeah, all these calamities have befallen humanity, but yet, like you said, 12% per year. And that's, that is remarkable. Yeah, the triggers are always different. Right. You know, I mean, 9-11 was a trigger, you know, the pandemic was a trigger, but the way it plays out, is always the same. Sometimes the market takes longer to recover. Sometimes, like for COVID, it recovered with stunning rapidity, but the pattern is always the same. Indeed, indeed. JL, my friend, this has been marvelous. I really appreciate all your time and your care and your expertise for the the community. It's been just amazing over, over these years. Again, a personal thank you for what you've done for my own life. And I just want to say the book is really genuinely great. Like you said, you can pick it up after you've read Simple Path or even before. And it, it, it is that companion. They go hand in hand. But I, I think you've convinced me that this might be the place to start because, again, stories make the world go round, right? Yeah. Well, thank you, first of all, for having me. It's always, as I said at the beginning, always fun to be on the show. And I, I always enjoy our conversations. And I'm so pleased that particularly somebody that's as familiar with this stuff and as astute as you are, that, that you found value in the book. and and enjoyed it. So it was certainly a pleasure pulling it together for me. And it feels great to have it out in the world now. So I I hope it benefits a lot of people. Yeah, I'm certain that it will. And so, right, the book came out October 31st, 2023. It's called Pathfinders, Extraordinary Stories of People Like You on the Quest for Financial Independence. And JL, obviously, I know this is, uh, you can find this anywhere books are sold. Is there anywhere in particular you want to send people to or just at their leisure, basically? No, not particularly. I mean, it's you can find it on Amazon. That you know, this is the first time that I've gone through a publisher. This is my third book, and Harriman House has a great distribution. So evidently, this is going to be in bookstores and even airports and what have you. So that's kind of exciting for me. It wasn't true of my first two books. So yeah, I think it'll be pretty easy to find. <laughs> All right, sounds good, my friend. Well, until next time, thank you again and. To the audience, this is really important, fundamental information, and I think you're going to get a lot of value out of this book. So enjoy Pathfinders.